Hey everybody, so this is going to be the second part of my three-part series on the kinetic molecular theory. If you'd like to watch the first part of this series, you can click that link right up there. That's going to take you to part one, which I would recommend since uh, in part two we're going to discuss some things uh, that you should know about that are covered in part one of this, of this three-part series. Uh, but without further ado, let's go. So again, just to review a little bit, uh, the kinetic molecular theory is simply a model for gas behavior. It's the simplest model for gas behavior. And under the kinetic molecular theory, uh, the gas is just a collection of particles that are in constant motion. And each particle is going to move in a straight line until one of two things will happen. Either that uh, particle is going to slam into another particle, or the particle is going to slam into the wall of the container. And in the last video, we discussed a couple of postulates of the kinetic molecular theory. Uh, one of them uh, was that all of the collisions between particles or between a particle and the container, uh, all those collisions are going to be completely elastic, meaning the total kinetic energy of the particles is the same before the collision as it is after the collision. None of that energy, none of that kinetic energy, which again is just energy due to motion, none of that is going to be dissipated as heat to the surroundings. It's all going to remain within that system. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to sort of look at how the kinetic molecular theory can be used to explain uh, all of these gas laws that we've learned about so far. Starting with Boyle's law. So Boyle's law states that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to the pressure if you assume a constant temperature and also if you keep the amount of the gas constant. So that means that, let's say we have this balloon here and it has some gas particles in it. If we were to uh, contract that balloon or compress that balloon, what we would be doing is essentially decreasing the volume. And what Boyle's law says is that if you decrease the volume, the pressure is going to increase. So as one goes down, the other one goes up. So the reason why the kinetic molecular theory can explain this is because when you have a smaller volume, you're going to get a greater frequency of collisions. So the, since the frequency of those collisions is going to increase, you're going to get a larger pressure because, again, that's where pressure comes from. It comes from the sum of those forces that the particles are applying to the wall of the container. So that's how the kinetic molecular theory can explain Boyle's law. Let's go ahead and talk about Charles's law for a minute. Now Charles's law, remember that states that the volume is directly proportional to the temperature if you assume that the pressure and the amount of the gas are constant. So that means, let's say we have this balloon with some gas particles in it. Uh, if we were to increase the temperature of this balloon by putting a Bunsen burner underneath it, then as the temperature of the gas increases, the volume will increase. The balloon will expand. And the reason why this is true, according to the kinetic molecular theory, is that when you increase the temperature, the average speed of those particles is going to increase, because again, they're not all moving around at the same speed. There's a distribution, but on average, when you fire up that temperature, the particles on average are going to be moving faster, which means they're going to have a higher uh, average kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic energy is just energy due to motion. And that's going to result in more frequent collisions. Now, if you have more frequent co collisions caused by an increase in temperature, well, that's usually going to increase the pressure. But again, if we keep that pressure constant, the only way for that pressure to remain what it is, despite that increase in temperature is for the volume to expand. And so that's why uh, Charles's law is true. That's why volume is directly proportional to the temperature. As one goes up, the other also goes up. Let's talk about Avogadro's law. Remember, Avogadro's law says that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the amount of the gas if you keep temperature and pressure constant. So if we had a balloon connected to this gas cylinder and we loosened up the valve on that cylinder and let in some more gas, well then that balloon is going to expand. The volume will go up as the amount of gas goes up. And the reason why that's true is, well, it's very similar to the explanation that we talked about for Charles's law. If you increase more uh, the, the amount of gas particles, that's going to cause more collisions within the container. And in order for the temperature and pressure to stay constant, the volume has to increase uh, with all those extra gas particles inside. 
Now, <clears throat> excuse me, now we're going to talk about Dalton's Law. And Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures states that uh, when you have a mixture of gases, the total pressure of the container is going, to e is going to be equal to the sum of the partial pressures, the sum of the pressures that each individual gas within that container is exerting. And the reason why Dalton's Law is true uh, has to do with the uh, first postulate of the kinetic molecular theory, which says that uh, the particles are assumed to have zero volume, even though they have mass. So since the, vo the particles are assumed to have no volume, again, because the volume of those individual particles is so negligibly small compared to the volume of the entire container, uh, those gases are going to act independently of one another. They're not really going to have any attractive forces or repulsive forces on each other. All they're going to do is travel in a straight line and then eventually they're going to collide with either another particle or the wall of the container. So, so far we have talked about how the kinetic molecular theory can be used to, uh, to account for Boyle's Law, Charles's Law, Avogadro's Law, and Dalton's Law. Now what we are going to do is we are going to use some principles of the kinetic molecular theory to derive the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law, remember that's PV equals NRT, and we're going to be able to derive this just by using the kinetic molecular theory. Now let me warn you, it's going to get pretty lengthy and it's going to get pretty mathematical. So if you don't like math, uh, then you could either, I would recommend that you either brace yourself or just stop the video right now because you might get a little frustrated. But if you're not afraid of the math, uh, then let's go ahead and dive right into it. So remember, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, an expression for the pressure of a gas. And remember, the pressure uh, is simply the force divided by the area. So the force is going to be the total amount of forces of all those individual gas particles bouncing off of their containers, and the area is just going to be the inside, the inner wall of that container. So pressure is the total force over the total area. Now, we, in order to get an expression for the total force, what we need to do is we need to get an expression for the force of each individual collision of those gas particles. And to do this, we're going to rely on the help of our good friend Isaac Newton. Uh, remember, um, I don't know if you remember or not, actually. Um, if you've taken physics, uh, you probably uh, are at least somewhat familiar with uh, Newton's laws of motion. And Newton's second law states that the force exerted by a particle is equal to the mass of that particle times its acceleration. So we're going to steal from Newton here, and we're going to get an expression for uh, the, uh, the force of each individual collision uh, by, doing, uh, by applying that second law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. And uh, what I've done here is I've kind of skipped a step here. I have uh, rewritten the acceleration term as delta V over delta T. So acceleration, so delta V over delta T is essentially just a synonym for acceleration where the V is the velocity, not volume, velocity of the particle. Uh, so it's the change in velocity divided by the change in time. So that's what that delta term means, change in. So again, lowercase v, that's velocity. Uppercase v, that's going to be volume. So the change in velocity uh, during a time interval, during a collision, uh, that's actually pretty easy if you assume that all of those collisions are completely elastic, or perfectly elastic, if you will. And by that I mean that, well, within that time interval, uh, initially, when the particle is traveling, uh, when it's about to slam into the container, uh, that's just going to be whatever its velocity is, v, and then after it's bounced backwards, its, uh, its velocity is going to be minus v. And so the change in the velocity is simply going to be 2 times v, 2 times the velocity. And so we can take this a step further and get another expression for the force of each collision, and that's going to be the mass times 2 times the velocity over the time interval, over delta t. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. We have an expression for the force of each collision, and that can uh, give us an expression for the total force, which can help us even further to derive the ideal gas law. But we've still got a long way to go. 
Now in order to relate the total force to the force of each collision, uh, we need to be able to get an expression for the number of collisions. So to get an expression for the number of collisions, well that's going to be uh, proportional to the number of particles uh, within a certain distance. So it's going to be proportional to the number of particles that are within a distance that's close enough to the wall of that container where a collision can actually take place. And that distance uh, can be represented as V delta T. Again, lowercase v for velocity, not volume. So the idea is velocity, that's in, let, let's say, meters per second. Uh, you multiply that by the time interval in seconds and that's going to give you uh, just meters. That's going to give you a unit for distance. So we need to sort of come up with an expression for the number of particles within that distance. Well, we can do this right here. So this expression down here, V delta T times A times N over capital V, that is an expression for the number of particles uh, within that distance. And let me just explain why. So A here in this equation, that's the area of the container. So that's the surface area of the container. N, this lowercase n, that's simply the amount of gas in moles, which we've already seen. And then the capital V, that's the volume. And so if we break down uh, this expression down here, if we look at just this V delta T times A term, well, that's an expression for the volume. Because again, this distance right here, that's V delta T, that's a distance. We multiply that distance by the area. That's going to give us the volume of the container. And then this N over capital V term, that is going to be the molar density of those particles, the amount of particles within that volume. And if we multiply volume by molar density, that's going to give us the number of particles or the number of moles of particles, either way. So we have here that the number of collisions, so far we have that the number of collisions is proportional to V delta T times A times N over capital V. Okay, so we're definitely going to use that and that's going to help us uh, a little bit further to uh, derive the ideal gas law. So again, again, the whole point of that was to be able to get another expression for the total force. Okay, so we have an expression for the force of each collision and we have an expression for the number of collisions. To get the total force, that's simply going to be the force of each collision times the number of collisions. And we can just kind of use those expressions that we just looked at in the previous slide uh, and plug those into this equation here to get an expression for the total force, which again is just part of that expression for the pressure of the gas. So the total force is going to be proportional to uh, the force of each collision, that's m uh, times 2v over delta t, again we uh, determined that in the previous slide, and that's going to be times the number of collisions, which again we just figured out the expression for number of collisions, which is v delta t times a times n over capital V. Notice that the equation for the total force has been turned into a proportionality. So again, the number of collisions is not equal to V delta T times A times N over V. It's proportional to it. And equations are not the same as proportionalities. Remember, proportionality just means as one goes up, the other goes up. As one goes down, the other goes down. And so that's why our equation for the total force has now been turned into a proportionality. Uh, but notice that we can actually simplify this expression down a little bit. Those delta T terms are going to cancel out. And that's going to give us a new expression uh, for the total force. It's going to be proportional to mv squared. Notice we have two v terms. We've got a v term right there, and we've got a v term right here. Lowercase v, by the way. Velocity, not volume. So it's going to be proportional to mv squared times a, the area, times n, the amount in moles, over capital V. And you may be asking yourself, well, where did the 2 go from that 2v term up there? Well, it doesn't really matter because we're dealing with proportionalities here. In other words, if something is proportional to 2 of something, then it's also going to be proportional to whatever that something is. So we can essentially just remove that 2 from this proportionality here. So, okay, so we have the total force is proportional to mv squared times a times n over capital V. And again, remember, a moment ago we established that 
the pressure is going to be the total force divided by the area of the container. And so if we uh, turn this equation into proportionality, we're going to have, uh, and we just plug in our expression for the total force, it's going to be mv squared times a times n over capital V, and then that total force is going to be divided by the area A. And now we can simplify this down even more because those A terms are going to cancel out. And we arrive at this important result here, which is the pressure is proportional to mv squared times n over capital V. So now we are really getting somewhere. It may not look like we are, but we definitely are. So allow me to just explain that. So again, so far we have pressure is proportional to mass times velocity squared times the amount in moles divided by the volume. And if you look closely at this proportionality, two of the gas laws are actually in this very proportionality. Uh, Boyle's law is located in this proportionality. Remember Boyle's law, that's volume is inversely proportional to pressure. Uh, so we have pressure over here on this side of the proportionality. And then over on the right side, we have uh, um, we have the volume in the denominator, so we definitely have Boyle's law here. We also have Avogadro's law, and again, Avogadro's law states that volume is directly proportional to the amount, and so if we were to multiply both sides of this proportionality by volume, we would get that V is proportional to N. So this proportionality already has Boyle's law and Avogadro's law. We just need to include Charles's law, which is the relationship between volume and the temperature of the gas. And to do that, we can use uh, postulate two of the kinetic molecular theory, which states that the temperature of the gas is gonna be proportional to uh, the average uh, kinetic energy. The average kinetic energy is going to be proportional to the temperature in kelvins. And the average, uh, or the kinetic energy of a part particle can be represented by one half times mass times velocity squared. And again, since this is a proportionality, we don't really have to worry so much about that one half term. If it's proportional to half of something, it's gonna be proportional to the something. So what we can do is we can take uh, that mv squared term and we can substitute it for t. And that's gonna give us this proportionality. We have pressure is proportional to t, the temperature, times n, the amount over capital V, the volume multiplying this proportionality on both sides by the volume gives PV is proportional to NT. And then finally, incorporating our proportionality constant uh, known as the ideal gas constant, um, we get our final result, which is PV equals NRT. Okay, so hopefully you're still with me. Um, I know that was a lot. Um, if you major in chemistry like I did, you'll be doing uh, this kind of thing all the time, especially when you take physical chemistry. And let me tell you, with physical chemistry, some of those derivations uh, make this one look like child's play. I mean, literally, they're enough to make your head spin. Um, but this one, I don't think this one was too bad. Uh, I think it's important to you know, understand the underlying theories, not just uh, you know, accept a gas law or any scientific law for that matter. Uh, just accept it as fact without actually understanding the underlying principles behind it all. Okay, so that is the end of the video. Uh, stay tuned uh, for part three. Um, if you'd like to watch part three, uh, go ahead and click that link right up there. That's going to take you to part three, and uh, that is all. So thank you very much for watching, and have a nice day.